Before we get to today's show, I want to note during this time of social isolation with no games to watch, it's not just the right time that's still churning out content for you. ESPN Podcast is adapting to this new normal, and honestly, the entire roster is thriving under these circumstances. Just this week, there have been new episodes of ESPN Daily, The Woj Pod, The Hoop Collective, The Mina Kime Show, The Low Post, and Baseball Tonight. You can listen to all of these and more wherever you get your podcast. Let's talk about Daniel. A year ago, he resolved to stop putting off what he wanted to do, get into information technology. Daniel enrolled in My Computer Career and is now already a few months into his IT career. Make 2020 your year. There are millions of unfilled cybersecurity positions in the U.S. right now, and My Computer Career is training people to help fill them. No IT experience or education? No problem. It's not rocket science. It's My Computer Career. Go to mycomputercareer.edu and take the free career evaluation today. You can start your new life as an IT pro in months, not years. Attend classes on campus or live online just twice a week to get what you'll need to start your new career. More than just a school, My Computer Career helps you get into the industry by working with hundreds of employers that hire our students. My Computer Career is nationally accredited and financial aid is available for those who qualify, including the GI Bill. Classes start soon, so make new year, new career your resolution and take the free career evaluation today at mycomputercareer.edu. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening wherever you get your podcast. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. Uh, it is that time of week where we do an interview, have a guest on, however you want to put it. Uh, I'm at my house joining me from his house, the best college football writer in America. His name is Spencer Hall. What's going on, man? Oh, you know, the usual, which is weird because now everybody else is on my usual. Right. <laughs> because I used to work from home. Like I, I read your thing was incredible about like what it is to work from home. I actually do not like working from home. Um, but I think part of it is because of the nature of the job that I do that, uh, like I'm not showing up to an office in the sense that other people are showing up to offices. Right. Like I got tired of not seeing people and all of that stuff. You know, it's good to have a rhythm of going in to see people and everything else. Uh, at the same time, man. I ain't gonna lie. I ain't put on draws in like three days. I forgot the liberation of working at home. Yeah, you know, the way I put it in that piece was that the problem with working at home and being by yourself, if you're going to be by yourself most of the time, is that you're the park ranger, but you are also the bear. (laughs) Right? Like, imagine being a park ranger who's also a bear. And if I've just lost you, I'm going to bring you back on this, okay? Okay. You, as the park ranger, have to keep everything in order. And also, you, as the bear, are going to want to get into every picnic basket, dumpster, and uh, mess you can possibly get into. There's really only one person to keep you on track, and there's also only one person to really mess up your whole business. And they're the same person. Congratulations. Now you all work at home. Yeah, like, uh, first world problems, but I think you'll understand me. I, I have a housekeeper who comes through. Because I need to protect myself from myself, right? Like, mm-hmm. I know who I am. I had a big reservation about getting a housekeeper for many, many years. And my brother explained to me, nobody likes to clean, but everybody likes it clean. I was like, okay, good call. But my housekeeper in her 60s, somewhere in there, it don't feel right, you know, to like, I'm, I'm pretending like I'm asymptomatic, right? So I can't have her come over. Today is the day that she would normally come over. Spencer, I don't know when the housekeeping is going <laughs> to uh, take place here. As I look around myself, and I'm just like, like normally what I do on Thursday morning, I do a sweep to prepare for the housekeeper. And then I come back, and it smells like fabuloso. I don't even get to come back now. I don't get to leave. There's Mm-mm. nowhere really to go. Yeah, you know who's going to have to be super fabuloso about this? You. Yes. You. Yes. That's right. You're going to have to get things in order, either because the goalie's been pulled, you know? Yeah, and, and let me explain something to you uh, Southerners out here. And maybe it was just everywhere that I ever lived. But, you know, I, I was basically, before I moved to Miami, I lived in places that had carpet, right? Mm-hmm. And you know how you clean carpet? 
with a vacuum. Right, right. You plug this thing in the wall and you hit a button and it runs across the floor. It ain't really that carpet life up here in New York City, just like it wasn't in Miami. So you know what that means? It's a sweeping life. And it's one thing to sweep the kitchen. It's one thing to sweep the bathroom. It's another thing to sweep the house. The whole goddamn house. Mm -hmm. Again, these are, these are very first world problems, but they are real. They are real. My, my favorite thing that I've learned to do working at home over the years is to get dressed. That's like, you have to, the problem is is that your life, if you are working at home, right, is going to be a, a matter of separating things, right? So that it's not just one big mush that you can't prioritize, right? You you have to have a place where you sleep, and that place has to be different than the place where you're doing your work, than you're doing your cooking, etc. Right? You have to have boundaries. Good boundaries make you a good neighbor to yourself, right? Um, also, it's a good way to change your mind, right? You go, ah, Spencer the chef is here. Watch as I prepare this turkey sandwich for myself, right? Um, over here, Spencer, the, the guy who writes about college football, I, he's over here and I can change into that. It's a good way to switch mental gears. The thing, um, the thing with that that you're going to struggle with, right? Is you go, okay, I'm going to get dressed and you'll look down and you'll go, well, how formal should I be? (laughs) Right. And the decision I, I landed on is that you should just go ahead and decide that you have some, some, business sweatpants that you got right which you know i think for younger people that's probably not a discernment that's too hard to go right because i know you're thinking you're like no I, I do have the nice sweatpants i know people in new york definitely have the business sweatpants and the non-business sweatpants right yes they're gonna be okay with this right so that's what i landed on like at the very least have like some some leisure pajamas and some business pajamas. Remember, even Mr. Rogers changed his shoes and his cardigan when he came in the door to let him know it's, it's a little bit different now. You got to be a different Fred. All right. Mm-hmm. Remember, be a different Fred to yourself and it's going to be a, a really happy neighborhood. You know, who's never mastered this, by the way? Hmm. Never. And it's just it basically proves my whole case wrong. It's Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick has never mastered this because he's been working from home for the better part of 45, 50 years. And his home's been the office, right? That's it. His, he's like lived in the office for 40 years watching film. And according to anyone who's had any contact with Bill Belichick, Bill does not understand clothing. He would just grab a garbage bag and a pair of sweats off the floor. And that's a shirt and tie, buddy. Except here's the thing. Whenever he has to dress for something, he's always right. I think he just entirely doesn't care. I, I think so. I think he's like whittled it down to the exact minimum amount of effort required for the job, right? And when he does appear in public with the suit, it's completely on point. That's when you remember he went to a prep school, Mm -hmm. right? And every now and then, life will remind you that Bill Belichick went to a prep school when he has to show up to a suit and you go, that is a very, very properly tied tie, sir. (laughs) Yes. Like that's that's what got me when I would realize it wasn't like he was like Doug Moe or one of these guys that just absolutely had no sense of these things. No, he has decided that that is his look like his football look is that. And by the way, like, I mean, according to Tom Brady himself, it's worse day to day in the office. (laughs) Like it's like it's embarrassingly bad was the term I'd heard. Yeah. Let me tell you how you know how good he is at his job. Right. Mm hmm. The fact that anybody listens to him and like the clowns that work with him who dress like him, right? Because my my biggest problem with McDaniels and that slob in Detroit, uh, Patricia is y'all can't do this, right? Like just because he can do this don't mean y'all can do this. So yeah, I might listen to Bill Belichick up there looking sloppy in that way. I ain't listening to Matt Patricia look sloppy. Who the hell are you? No, because remember one of the things you're always wearing around is your resume, right? Yes. Like. You can do that. Also, don't think the suit and tie is going to fool any of us, right? That, <laughs> that, that That's it. Like when you go, you know, we're all about business. So we're showing up in a suit and a tie. Not when you're four and 12. <laughs> like, but here's the thing. I'll give you a chance, right? Like if you show up at least looking like you give a f- I will give you a chance. If you show up like you looking like you don't, then you're going to have to give me a chance. 
them's the rules, right? If you have decided that you don't need to look like you're here to do your job, I don't need to look at you like you're here to do your job, right? Show me a little, act like, Act like you care a little bit. That's all I'm asking. Just act like you care just a little bit. And Belichick was like, yo, rings. I don't have to act like I care. Okay, boom, you got it. Matt Patricia, son, act like you care. Please, I'm begging you. Now I'm going to be looking at every college football coach's tie and just to see if they actually tied it themselves because my guess is this, that if it's very well tied, that was an assistant. This is a very interesting question to ask. How many college football coaches tie their own ties because i imagine there's a significant number who do not know how to tie their own ties like i don't know about you brother but i have a hard time believing that ed ogeron is tying his own tie except i feel like ed ogeron spent a significant portion of his life where he had to tie his own tie because he was not powerful enough to have someone else tie a tie for him that is correct he he for a long time he had to show up on time speak in an uncolorful fashion or at least in as uncolorful a fashion as he's capable of speaking right yes no he didn't he didn't have that kind of swag he didn't have that kind of rank right mm-hmm. this is why i think it's very clever that now nike understanding this and other providers of sideline gear have now just begun giving coaches like bags to wear right yes. like the matt rule baylor like the smock or <laughs> Or going back a little bit, the Gene Chizik shacket. They know. They're like, listen, just put these dudes in some cloth bags with zippers and <laughs> buttons. Don't have them fiddling with anything because they'll view that. I guarantee you, a coach has been like, that's 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 too much zipper. I, I have too many things to think about on game day. Don't make me think about a fourth zipper. That's like kind of a joke, but it's it's also not. Can I go ahead and also mention one Ed Ogeron thing now that you brought up Coach Cookie Monster himself? Yes, please do, as I am imagining him on his first job interview. Yeah, oh, man, just the most intense. Before he figured out how to do it. (laughs) Man, I think he got hired because they were like, we can't tell him no. (laughs) You got it, you got it. You're the coach. coach. (laughs) Yeah, man, God, that guy was a pit bull in a suit, you know? Like, just bring him in, let him in, feed him, feed him. Maybe he'll like us and won't hurt us. Um, The thing with Ed Ogeron, Ed Ogeron's been – point man for John Bell Edwards and the rest of the Louisiana yes. state government's attempts to uh, get people to stay inside and flatten the curve on COVID-19 and coronavirus. He, at the press conference he did with the governor of Louisiana, and I just mentioned that intentionally because, yeah, when the governor's showing up for this, guess who else is coming along for the ride? Ed Ogeron, the yes. other governor, yes. right? And there was a sign language interpreter. <laughs> and... You know, the sign language interpreter is doing what I think is a pretty controlled job, right? Hands are moving, things, you know, obviously like very into his work, doing a great job telling all of our deaf citizens what to do, right, in the event of this pandemic. And you can tell he's kind of mimicking John Bell Edwards' cadence, right? His, his, because American Sign Language has dialects and emphasis and, you know, different ways of saying things. And um, you can kind of look at it and tell, right? So Ed Ogeron walks up. And Ed Ogeron, you know, Ed, Ed starts talking. And when he starts talking, the American Sign Language interpreter's hands start going so hard. <laughs> they start going so hard. And it's obvious that the dude is trying to give everyone listening via American Sign Language with their eyes, an idea of how powerful this man's voice is through his hands. It's beautiful. It's great translation work, but I fell out the minute I saw it because I thought, oh, this is a challenge. You got to let people know that the guy who is talking is basically has a rock monster living in his throat. Yo, and see, the thing about that that I find interesting is that person is probably, I don't know. Let's say maybe they're doing that for the people on TV less than for the people in the crowd because Mm -hmm. while the people who are hearing impaired have obviously impaired hearing, they can still like feel bass. You understand what I'm saying? And I imagine that like if you're in the building with the sound system that they have for Ed Ogeron talking, like they feel that they know what's going on. I appreciate the sign language interpreter making sure the people understand. No, there's nothing wrong with the sound system. That's just how that dude gets down. No, it's just a human subwoofer over there. Right? Yes. Yes. Want to hear a story about bass and a deaf person? Yeah. So I have a very good buddy. He may be listening to this. I never have any idea, but a very good buddy of mine from graduate school. And I love this dude. One of my favorite people in the world. And I noticed when I met him that, uh, like, 
he's one of those really funny people whose voice doesn't ever change. Right. So like part of the joke is that you have to pick up like, oh, everything just changed except your voice, like in the maneuvering of the story. And I found out he told us later that his parents uh, were deaf. They met at Gallaudet. And so he says his parents are have I mean, his dad was kind of going through one of the midlife crises when he was in high school. And so he had bought, I think it was a Miata. Right. Remember when the Miata hit the streets mm-hmm. and like all the old dudes are getting the Miata. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He got the Miata and he said he used to ride in the car and listen to rap in the car with his parents and he said his dad liked to play the tapes when he wasn't in the car because he could feel the bass right and by the way i had never considered this right like if you're deaf and both your parents are deaf you can listen to whatever you want at the crib right never thought about that yeah all the, all the time they're gonna they're yeah. gonna they're gonna know when you put on like you know the 808s yeah 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 they just don't but they don't but they can't hear the words so like yeah. you are now no longer limited by this so anyway he said his dad had been playing the tapes and uh, one day, his dad came to pick him up at school. He's in high school. Dad comes to pick him up in high school, in the Miata, top down, one hand on the wheel, cocked to the side, aviator shades, and like one of them skipper hats. Oh, yeah. You got to have the cap. That's your yacht. So yes. you, you're yes. the captain. Yeah. Yes. All those things happening with the two live crew playing. As soon as he pu- <laughs> and, 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 and as soon as he pulls up to this high school in Montgomery County, Maryland, the song happens to be a part that says, and I quote, pull up my shirt and you can suck my <laughs> with his head cocked to the side. And he said his pops looked over and just gave a nod like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he told his dad years later what the content was on the tapes and uh he was not pleased <laughs> oh, it's you know the the little icing on that particular cake is the captain's hat yes <laughs> yeah. see these are the kinds of stories that and I don't use this term pejoratively. I think this is how life should be. But in this era of political correctness, these are stories that people are afraid to tell because they don't know what the joke is, right? Yeah. I am not laughing at deaf people. No. I am laughing at the totality of circumstances <laughs> that leads us to this. Like, that's a movie scene. Yeah, where you pull up and, like, Uncle Luke yes. is blasting. Yeah, any scene where you can get a parent and really profane rap in the same situation yes absolutely necessary you know and now we can bring this back around to ed ogeron and say there is a market here first of all generally speaking i feel like there's a market for well i guess not anymore because people don't buy stuff in this way but like back in the day they could be selling like records like 45s of ed ogeron pep talks in louisiana and them things Mm -hmm. go platinum in louisiana right but yeah. we need this, man. Just Ed Ogeron, put his bass on your subwoofers and see what happens. <laughs> That's, I have, I, I did remix Go Tigers. I have a, like, just for my own personal entertainment, the beat from Still Tippin' mm-hmm. with LSU Go Tigers. And it matches up perfectly, and you don't have to pitch shift anything. It's <laughs> right there. Like, if, you, if you're like, wow, Ed Ogeron has, like, actual subwoofer bass deep voice. It's It's true. If you compare it to like, if you put it in the mix, it's right there. You don't have to change a thing. This is where we are, Spencer. It's March the 19th. Mm -hmm. This is what we've got. Like the world has stopped. Yeah. Funny story. You know where I was supposed to be today? Yeah. You're supposed to be in Vegas. That is correct. You know what Vegas looks like right now? It's dark. (laughs) It is dark. They've got the lights on, on the logos, like the Harris Casino letters have lights on. The rest of the hotel is dark. (laughs) <laughs> Just completely dark. I was supposed to land there at around 2.30 Las Vegas time today. And if I had gotten there, my hotel would have been closed. The casino inside my hotel would have been closed. Everything except for the Panda Express in Las Vegas would have been closed. Which I am certain, by the way, that despite all Las Vegas health orders and every single good piece of advice you hear about the pandemic and staying in and staying isolated, the Panda Express on Las Vegas Boulevard is still open. It, if they set off a bomb in that place, it would still be open. If they if the world ended 15 minutes afterwards, they would still be serving kind of sketchy egg rolls. That's how reliable and indestructible that Panda Express is. The rest of Vegas, though, 
dark. <laughs> yo, Pat Express is just like, yo, get <laughs> and go. Like, yeah. like this is this is the only thing. I'm really not blaming anybody for still trying to get this money because this money still has to be gotten, right? Yeah. I've seen people make a very good point about rent. And they're like, yo, we should have a hold on rent payments in this time. And I get where people are coming from, but I also thought about it. I'm like, you need to understand not every landlord is a baron, right? Oh, <laughs> there's some dude that's just got a second house that he been written out and counting on that money. And that's like, yo, I'm not getting paid and I'm not getting paid. Yeah. No, I mean, there's some guy down in like Pinellas County, Florida, right? There's some guy down in St. Pete who's like, Hey, uh, you know, that place I got in, uh, in the Bronx. Yeah. It's crazy. I'm not getting any rent payments. That means I can't pay the rent on my house down here in Florida. Like I'm not overly sympathetic. Cause you're kind of an absentee landlord, but I, 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 I get your stress cognitively. I understand why that might be kind of a stressor. By the way, that's like half of Florida. People who are like living in like, yeah, I'm pretty modest three, two. And they're like, yeah, you know, like I, I got some real estate in New York. What that means is they've got like one spot out in Staten Island. Yes. Right. Yeah. You know, I got some investments up there. Okay. They, they have a house out in Staten Island or they have like a spot in Queens that they've rented and they're like, I'm going to go live the beach life in Florida. And you know what they end up doing? They end up in St. Pete or Tampa, you know, just living in like pretty normal apartment complex, right? Like, yeah, life's a beach. They went twice, <laughs> twice maybe, right? With the metal detector. And they're like, I can't find anything here. And that's it. That's their big, that's their Florida life. They're like, it's crazy good down here. That means, <laughs> yeah, that means that they go to the Panda Express in Tampa, actually. Yeah. Yo, this is like as bad as it must be like right now at these times, if you owe somebody money. I imagine it's also really bad if somebody owes you money. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. You, you don't want that. You don't want any of this. Like the chains of things that, that are sort of falling here. Okay. Like going back to Vegas, right? It's not just that. Okay. Standard business is closed, right? All standard businesses in Las Vegas are closed. It's during March madness, right? March Madness, which kicks off the, like, I can spin this sports forward here just for a second. If March Madness is canceled, it's not just that uh, the NCAA is going to lose pretty much their sole source of, of of income, right? Football doesn't do that much. There's like a couple of other streams of revenue they have, but something like 85, 80% of the NCAA's total, like, money for the year comes from the tournament. Okay, that's cool. We could go get insurance, right? Yeah, it doesn't cover all of it, and it doesn't cover it for all of the schools. So, what you might see as a result of this, like chaining down in terms of who who's going to come up short in terms of owing money, um, the NCAA is one. But all of those smaller schools, right, our Ionas of the world, it's it's going to be a real rough picture for them. You're going to see a lot of programs. Like there will be some that fold Yo, for a while as a result H of this. HBCUs. Yeah. I, like that was the thing that hit me when people were talking about these conference tournaments and why are they still going? I'm like, yo, this is the budget. Yeah. That's it. That's the, that's the whole budget. You know, it's like, okay, if we had football going right now and you get that one HBCU game where Howard goes and gets tuned up 90 to seven by Maryland, right? That's most of their budget for the year because that's, you know, a good chunk of the budget because they're getting what? Three hundred fifty, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars to do that game that they don't even have to really travel for very far. Yeah, that's that's a significant chunk of their budget. That just happened for college basketball. Everyone, everyone. Duke's going to be like fine, right? But your bizarre, like your you know your St. Mary's of the world, your your smaller schools, it's going to get real dire for them. Yeah, no, this is like this is this is this is the not fun part of this is it's going to be like all the things they talked about, like paying players is going to cause doomsday and everything else. Nah, nah, nah. Doomsday is going to do that. Actually. Yeah. Don't infringe on, you know, doomsday. Doomsday doesn't like that. Don't do copyright infringement there. Okay. Doomsday can take care of that itself. Even a pretty slow rolling one, you know, like it doesn't take much to upset, you know, it really doesn't take much to upset this sort of, you know, metaphorical apple cart when you're talking about, well, how much disruption do you need to make a serious difference and the money that goes through college athletics turns out not much. Yeah. Like, okay, NFL, um, other major leagues, et cetera, right? You're going to see a lot of very specific contract language that's going to buffer against this a lot better. You know, that's basically two parties, right? Like league and network. League and network can like carve this out and then they'll deal with their subsidiaries, right? In college athletics, it's not like that, right? In college basketball, the NCAA does the negotiation for the tournament, but in something like football, 
where you've got conference deals, it gets a lot hairier down the line. And I think there's a lot less protection for everyone involved, right? When it comes to like insurance, getting some money back and keeping the lights on. I think what you're going to see is that the lights won't be kept on. Let me tell you what's got to be disheartening for college basketball in this. You can let me know if I'm wrong about it, but this is, I don't know if you how you feel. And I'm more of a basketball person than you are. I don't miss this tournament at all. Right. Like like this is used to be a time in my life where this is like this right here. This I got like at the time that we're taping this, we're taping this about 30 minutes before the tournament like really starts going. That used to be like super exciting times, man. I wasn't really looking forward to watching that trash basketball. And I don't like it's not a good look for the NCAA that I don't feel like the streets are clamoring for their tournament right now. Like even in spite, like, great, yeah, we got more important stuff to care about, right? But if the Corona was going to mess up the Super Bowl, we'd all be mad as hell about there not being no Super Bowl. I don't get the feeling that the world is like, damn, we ain't got no tournament. Keep in mind, the part that I'm missing about that was going in and out and, and acting really foolishly in Las Vegas for a couple of days. Otherwise, you know how much I, I know about the tournament as somebody who works in sports? Could I have named what who was going to be a one seed? I know this year was a little confusing. A little strange in college basketball, but I, I couldn't name, you know, like a two seat. I couldn't name who's our Zion Williamson this year. You got a player you can just throw out there. Most people watching it would stammer and go, uh, uh, doesn't they? No, you don't know. And that's, that's really bad because one of the things that they really over indexed on, like one of the things college basketball asked you to believe was that this event was special and this event meant more than anything else and that the players involved were secondary to the tournament ultimately that meant that the teams were going to become somewhat subservient and secondary to the tourney right and that the tourney when you take it out what's left of the sport diehards in the acc and the big 12 five guys who want me to know how great the pac-12 is and insist that i should really should give it a shot right and and that's and everyone in the SEC uh, wondering why we continue to have this sport except for Kentucky. That's <laughs> that's really that's really the bulk of of everything going on with college basketball. Once you get past that diehard, it's like it is for a sport, and this is like financially and in terms of interest. This is the tiny little dwarf that becomes a gargantuan ogre for about three seconds every March, right? And then it shrinks back to its normal size. They don't have good players. Like, that's what it comes down to is you don't have anybody who really gets to a point that you care about watching them. There's, it's, it's, it's just not there. The other thing, the worst thing that ever happened to the tournament, and this is where money can mess up a good thing. And I understand why they did it and it comes with all kinds of advantages, but the tournament seemed a whole lot more entertaining when it was the first red zone channel. Yeah. Cause when it was only coming on CBS, they were basically just piping you in to either something that was relative to your market or they were piping you in on like, yo, this is the game that's cracking. And so all you got was the cracking. Now we have access to all the not cracking and it is not cracking. No, because at one point you're going to be sitting there watching true TV on your couch going, I've never seen people miss 13 threes before outside of a Houston <laughs> Rockets game. Right. I've never seen this many bricks outside of, uh, you know, a construction site. It's wild that they diluted the product. I mean, I know why they did it, right? It's one of those things where you can go, well, here's why they did it. And explaining things is like, explaining things is so deeply overrated, right? <laughs> if you're up on a certain basic level of knowledge, well, here's why they did it. Okay, cool. I'm going to bring you back to this part. They made it worse. They made it worse. Well, yeah, I mean, they just, they did what people wanted them to do. No, they did what the money told them to do. Which is that I can get more money if I do this. Put it across these channels. That's cool. Now I'm going to watch, you know, some like 34 32 game, right? When instead I used to just get only the best piped into it, right? Like that's kind of awesome that CBS used to do that. Yes. Apologies for everybody here who wanted to see, uh, Canisius versus, uh, St. Bartholomew's, uh, in the first round, but that game is trash. We're going to stay with this one. <laughs> they used to just do that for you. And if you think about it and you watch other events like that, it's kind of contagious, right? Like at the Masters, you're like, hmm, I don't know. I haven't heard from KJ Choi in a while. That's basically CBS being like, yeah, you don't want to pay attention to what KJ is up to right now. Trust me on this. It's better, there's better <laughs> going on at 17. <laughs> <laughs> like, like basically there is in their head this little like spectrum, right? Like the PTI spread where at the top there's like, okay, man, 
Like, this guy's doing real well. And at the bottom, there's my poor hypothetical KJ Choi rated in the trash category, right? Like, how's KJ doing? Trash. Don't look. Don't look. It's bad. Yo, let me tell you something that's a little overrated. It's interesting because the whole industry is going away from this. But biggest change in American life in the last, like, 50 years is smaller families, right? Yeah. You do wind up raising, I don't want to say more entitled children. Right. But like if you're a parent and you're cooking and you got four kids, chances are one kid's going to have to eat something they don't like. If you're a parent and you're cooking and you got one kid, it's a lot easier to work out something that that one kid is going to like and that everybody else can eat. And so that kid is never really having to like eat anything that they don't like. And I say this as a person who grew up under a very similar circumstance because my siblings are much older. But you know what I mean? Like that's what you wind up with. So when you got that one kid, that one kid basically is going to get like there's no reason for that kid not to get most of what they want because it's normally not interfering with anything that's going on with anybody else. So as a result, we have wound up at this point where people greatly value the idea of I can have exactly what I want, right? Not just like kind of something sort of what you want, but like exactly what you want. And the way that we consume entertainment right now is we're going to put all this stuff on this over the top service and you can go in there and you can find exactly what you want, right? Like it's all going to be set up in that way. Got you. Sometimes it works out better if you let somebody else do the curation. Oh yeah. All this stuff on Netflix, I can find exactly what I want. It might work out better if a person's like, nah, this, this right here, believe it or not, this is what you want. Oh word. And I don't mean that necessarily like an algorithm. I mean that like the CBS guy was, where he was like, nope, this is the game that's cracking. Put it on. But 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 my cousin plays for put put that game on. You don't want to watch your cousin like on his fifth foul. <laughs> you know you don't you don't want to watch your cousin go one for seventeen from the field. No. What you what you want to do is afterwards. You know you don't want to see how sorry they're being at that moment. More things like this should happen in life, right? If you were going to send that email talking about how you were doing and it's not going real well to a friend or make that phone call, maybe the great CBS producer of life should just step in and go. We're just going to hold on this one. <laughs> we'll come back to you when the action gets competitive, okay? And you'll be like, oh, I respect that. That's great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Spare me, right? Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Just like I know golfers really appreciate that, right? Nobody wants to. Like it would be the s- most sadistic thing. And it would take you a minute to catch on that they were doing it, right? But if it's like, ooh, you just got eight on eight. So let's go to nine where he's currently on his 11th shot. <laughs> The minute they see that light go on on the camera, they're like, oh, no, God, the entire nation is just seeing how much I suck. But if that light stayed on for the next hole, like, let's see what happens. That producer is a cruel person, right? (laughs) Get the people what they want. Yeah, exactly. I'm sorry. People want to watch you fail. They're really enjoying the schadenfreude here. They're just rolling in it, you know? Like on Twitter, you can kind of do this with football games. And I've kind of been that person for a very small slice of a population. But when you go like, hey, listen, he's throwing three picks in the first eight minutes of this game. Let's see where this goes. Yes. Right. You know, there might be kind of a business in that. But I will also admit there's a little bit of cruelty. I will also admit this. I want to see the seventh pick. If you're on six interceptions, chuck it. Throw it up. I want to see it. I'm so mad that I was in a car the day the Peter man had that game. Uh, for the, for the Bills. They were playing the Chargers. Yeah. And I was going to, uh, I was going to meet Corey at Barclays. And that's like a 40 something minute ride from my house. And while I was in the car, the Peter Man threw five interceptions. <laughs> 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 while I was in the car. You got a five interception car ride. I was refreshing his individual page on the app and it was, it was like a slot machine. It would just be another one. <laughs> See, this is where football, like, to me, has, I think, a good emotional economy. Because if the game's real bad, it's not one person's fault, usually. Unless it's Nathan Peterman playing, right? Right. Like, usually, if, you know, if a quarterback throws five interceptions and they're a good quarterback, it's because the receiver was running wrong routes. They didn't get protection. They were under pressure. The defense was allowing too many points. There's a lot of circumstances I can point to, right? Individual sports, we're in Richie Tenenbaum territory, right? You're like, do I really want to show up and watch somebody have a nervous breakdown? Uh, like, I got to admit, 49% of me wants to. But the 51% of me that's decent will admit and say, no, 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 we shouldn't do that. Am I still going to watch a little bit of it? <laughs> yeah, because I'm a terrible human. You know, especially now. Like, oh, man, there's no sports on. If they're like, hey, do you want to watch two really terrible athletes go head to head? Right? Like, do you want to watch two NFL defensive linemen 
play a full set at Wimbledon? Absolutely. I would watch that right now. <laughs> yeah. And, and it would be wildly impressive. It would be. No, like, like, uh, I always put like, like in my head, this is two spice atoms, right? Yes. If I just put two defensive linemen in tiny tennis shorts, right? And headbands on grass at Wimbledon and just see if they can get to like a 20 rally point once. It would be spectacular. You go, Hey, these big men have much better feet than I remember. Right? Like, they're far more nimble. No, we need to come up with, like, just the linemen superstars, right? Because, you know, these have, like, the quarterback challenge and stuff like that. If we could – I almost don't want to say this in front of people. We Because the problem is by the time linemen stop playing football, they're too beat up to do this. Get, like, offensive linemen and just, like, take three offensive linemen to go play three-on-three three at your local court and just hoop dudes up. Oh, the minute one of them pulls up from 30 feet and it looks smooth, that's when jaws drop. Right. Yes. Like, well, like when you get like a big man who can actually drop threes or pull a low post move that's not outright thuggery. Right. Like when you get somebody, <laughs> when you get somebody in the low post who pulls in a, like a Hakeem on somebody. Yes. Right. And does something graceful. You'll be stunned. I would have them do this. Like I would have them play like there is a, by the way, a current prospect from the 2020 class in Georgia who put a video of him playing tennis online and it is so smooth. It is just gorgeous. It's like, it's like watching a hippo pick up a racket and do the entire Fantasia ballet sequence, right? Like, it's so graceful. And we just need that. Like, anything where you have, like, individual skills where I can show you how deft and how dexterous and how absolutely coordinated these huge people are, right? Like, defensive linemen, I would want to put a defensive line. Like, do you remember they used to have the big man? There was an NFL network ad. That was the big man dance challenge. Had like Grant Wistrom mm -hmm. doing the electric slide, right? Had Bredston Buckner, I think, dancing. I would watch like the big lineman dance challenge. The NFL Network needs to put that on. All right. I'm not saying all the time. I'm just saying eight installments, tournament format. Let everybody get out there and do their best dance. I will watch the entire thing because they are so much more coordinated and light on their feet than you can imagine. More in a minute with Spencer Hall, but first, what if a quarterback completed four out of his five passes? Or a point guard hit four out of five shots behind the arc? Well, now, when you're hiring, you can play at that level. Because four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. No matter the industry, healthcare to manufacturing to business services, ZipRecruiter makes hiring faster and easier. And today, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Bomani. ZipRecruiter doesn't wait for the right candidates to find you. ZipRecruiter's AI scouts talent for you. First, when you post your job on ZipRecruiter, it gets sent out to over 100 top job sites. Then ZipRecruiter's powerful matching technology learns what you're looking for, identifies people with the right skills and experience, and invites them to apply to your job. So you get qualified candidates fast. And now, to try ZipRecruiter for free, my listeners can go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Bomani. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash B-O-M-A-N-I. ZipRecruiter.com slash Bomani. ZipRecruiter, smartest way to hire. So I want to, as we just hear, bouncing around the world of all the worlds, I want to ask you this. I forgot to mention I was going to ask you this, but whatever. As much as I understood a lot of these businesses hold now because of the financial ramifications and everything else, was there anything more pathetic than these people just not wanting to cancel their spring games? Alabama waited until an hour before spring practice to cancel. An hour. Now, I will tell you this about spring games. Coaches really like canceling them. <laughs> the coronavirus is a terrible thing. It's going to cause a lot of damage. And people are going, there's going to be a lot of misery, a lot of suffering as a result of it. Deep in the hearts of some college football coaches, they're going, well, there was one good thing. It's got that they got to cancel spring games. You're playing yourself, only injuring yourself, doing so for attendance that is meaningless and putting on kind of an exhibition, which I think if you want to do it and you don't want to cancel the spring game in the future, right? Then what you're going to have to do is you'll have to turn it into an exhibition. I'd much rather watch. A, a, like, alumni versus current squad flag football game, okay, than I would watch a full crack and pads scrimmage. I really would, because those are strictly for only the most degenerate of hardcore fans, right? It would be much more entertaining to me to watch the University of Miami alumni flag football team 
versus the current University of Miami flag football team. And not just because I'm convinced there would be a fight. Yeah, and I want to see specifically alumni that's not in the league, right? Like dudes for whom this is their time to shine. Yeah, or, you know, because this has been tried before. Were you aware that in the early 80s, the University of Alabama had an alumni versus current squad game in the spring? I did not. I'm not kidding you. A freshly retired Kenny Stabler suiting up <laughs> at quarterback to play in live full contact fire <laughs> against 20, 21, 22 year old athletes with no understanding of pain or injury. That really happened. The footage is on YouTube. Just go search. I think it's Alabama alumni game, right? Uh, I'm not sure the exact year. It might have been like 84. 83 somewhere in there yeah go look it up the results are painful they're very very painful hold on i'm looking this up right now just because i'm trying to think of who was on that alabama team at that time because it sounds like ken stabler may have met a gentleman by the name of cornelius bennett that is entirely probable 1985 yeah that's in the bennett era can i just say this that's far too long into the 80s for Ken Stabler to be out there in a football uniform, in yes. my opinion. Hold on, playing that version of football. Not the football we got now. No, no, the kind where they said a good a good tackle begins at the head. <laughs> not not that version of football. Mike Shula is in that game at quarterback yes. against Ken Stabler. Yeah. Ken Stabler by the way already has like the full white beard and the white hair. Not just in the Raiders thing. No, I mean, like, he looks like he's walked out of the announcer's booth playing in this game. Yes. How is that possible? Like, why are you here? I have an answer to that. He's a South Alabama Viking. This is one of my, you know, we have, we, we've talked about this before, but like, Kinston, North Carolina only turns out Spartans, right? If you're from Kinston, you got like a 50-50 shot at being some kind of indestructible immortal of a person, right? South Alabama, particularly Foley, in that area, I know two people who are from that area, and they both confirm my theory. One is Ken Stabler, who Ken Stabler's childhood, if you read his autobiography, Snake, uh, defined in part by watching his dad beat his uncle's ass at the dump in front of a crowd because <laughs> they got into a fight, he and his brother. And he said, well, we're just going to have to take this to the dump. And everyone in Foley went down there and watched Ken Stabler's dad beat the hell out of Ken Stabler's uncle. Like in front of a crowd, like, well, I guess this is what we're doing today. <laughs> and I ain't, ain't much else going on in Foley. Uh, other person I know from there is Quintoris Lopez Jones, yes. a.k.a. Julio Jones. Julio Jones has managed to be a future Hall of Famer NFL legend while playing for the Atlanta Falcons. That is pretty much all you need to know about the kind of people who come out of South Alabama, right? Either you make it or you don't. And if you make it, you're pretty much, you know, a Viking in cargo shorts and flip flops. Went to college with a girl from Foley and my homeboys convinced her that Foley, Alabama had the highest concentration of lesbians in the United States. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't remember how exactly they went about what? doing it. But, uh, was she like, seems like science. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like they, 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 like they added a bunch of stuff. Like they did it. You know what I mean? Like they, they, they had some theory behind it, but they walked away with her convinced that Foley, Alabama had the highest concentration of lesbians in the United States of America. <laughs> oh my God. We all think of different things when we think of Foley, Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> the alumni game that Alabama won. If you look down the roster, you go, all right, most of these guys like Sylvester Crooms in that game. He graduated in 74. This is 85. That's 11 years later. Croom was probably still in like, you know, I could take a couple snaps kind of shape, right? <laughs> he was okay. Can I tell you some uh, one disturbing one that pops out here, though? There's an Angelo Danaludi at offensive line. Graduated in 1934. <laughs> what? I really hope they didn't suit him up. How many guys of the alumni team had never played with a black person? <laughs> Time out. Time out, y'all. Time out. Did you know he was on the field? <laughs> wait, wait. Angelo, wait. dude. Angelo, buddy. We gotta have a thought. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just trying to catch up to things here. <laughs> I mean, look, there wasn't black people playing in Alabama when Ken Stabler played there. So I know damn well they went out there for Angelo. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I mean, Angelo, do you think they had the talk with him before, right? Okay, listen, buddy. 
listen, you're just going to have to, this is, this is how we do things now. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. This is how long, by the way, that like I, Angelo Danaludi was on the field for that, right? He graduated in 1934. In 1934, the coach at Alabama was the legendary Frank Thomas, right? Also real successful at Clemson later on. Okay. This is how old Angelo Danaludi was and how far back his connections went to this 85 game. Frank Howard coached Bear Bryant. Frank Howard played quarterback for Newt Rockney. <laughs> Angelo Danaludi's coach, his roommate, Frank Thomas's roommate at Notre Dame was George Gipp, a.k.a. the Gipper. I'm just trying to drive home the point. This is how much Angelo Danaludi, who was born before, like, electricity was widespread, okay, should not have been on the field in 1985 with Cornelius Bennett. <laughs> He is the connective tissue of college football history. What are you doing, Angelo? What are you on? They couldn't let him on the field. If I watch that film and I just see a little spot turn to dust, I'll know that was Angelo. And I'll know that was probably Cornelius Bennett who did it to him. Wow. All of this happened. All of this happened. See, this is what, this is, this is what isolation is doing for us. See, that's, this is my point, by the way, right? Like, like, what, you go, oh man, why are they talking about this? What's the point? My point is, nobody in history's ever been paying attention. Nobody. <laughs> I guarantee you, in 85, Angelo's like, I want to shoot up. And they're like, yep, yeah, put, put a jersey on him. Go ahead. <laughs> like, he, he just had to go out with a coy toss, right? Like, that's the only. <laughs> I, don't, I hope so, but I can't guarantee that. That's my point. Most of history has been completely out of pocket. Nobody paying attention, right? Somebody in the stands is like, probably shouldn't put that 78-year-old man up there. Kenny Stabler's like, you can't tell a man what to do. <laughs> How are you going to tell a man what to do? That's what this whole week has been. I just saw it. Atlanta <laughs> just shut down the gym, like gyms and all that stuff. And I thank you for saving my mother's life. Because, <laughs> all right, your mother... And my mother, they're both intelligent people, right? Yes. They're both really super smart, but they're over the age of 60. Can you tell them what to do if they want to do something that you think might be inadvisable? It's hard. Mama, please don't go to the gym. Well, they're only eight. Because she was like, I went to the gym and there are only eight people there. I'm like, all right, let's start there. <laughs> like, well, they have the spray to wipe out. Could you please not? It's all I'm asking. Could you please not? Because one of the tragic things about this circumstance is if you get sick, I can't come see you. Yeah, that, that's it. I, I have to look at you from behind a window. Dude, I live in a city that's just full of Petri dishes. Like, we get around in cars that everybody uses, on subways, everything else. Like, that's the nature of this. So, like, what's the subway got to be a bad idea? Keep it real. Self-isolation became the only play. Yeah. Now, I mean, out here in car land, it's a little different. That that's wild when you can go run a drive through or you can run like, you know, I had to go to a storage facility. Right. And you go there pretty much in hazmat mode. Right. But a storage facility, there's nobody in there. Right. And it's a real low touch environment anyway. And I had to do that. Still felt nervous about it. But out here in Carland, it's a little different because you can see people and you're driving past them. And it's like, oh, hey, how you doing? Stay in your box. Stay in, stay in your little box, buddy. My little box is going to pass yours and we'll wave. And that's it. The, the roads here, the, it's weirder that they're not completely dead, right? If they were completely dead, you'd go, well, we're all committed in this situation. No, no, no. There's still some stuff going on, but like just enough to let you know that something's deeply wrong and off. Yes. And look, it's going to be people still out here. You know why? And I saw somebody made this point on Twitter and they're correct, which is the privilege of being able to do your job at home. Like I got that in the super like white collar sense. I can't do a television show from here, right? We can do a podcast, whatever, but I can't. You know, like people are piping in and doing Skype stuff and things, but they're really going like the extra mile here. This is not equipped for you to be able to do from your house. But most people got jobs like that work with your hands life. Ain't no doing that from home. No, 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 no. And there's, you know, like the the, the, the delivery people. These are the people we're going to write like songs about. Right. Like there's one there's one Grubhub dude, one Grubhub lady who's going to become like a folk hero. Right. Like I needed those chicken wings. Those chicken wings kept my family alive. And, and that person, the brave Grubhub delivery person, right? I hope you tip them like a thousand dollars. I hope you tip them a ridiculous amount of money. Yeah, because- I, I, I've been tipping them heavy. Uh, and let me tell you something, brother. Let me tell you what I'm seeing a lot of on Seamless: restaurant closed, not like closed till closed out. Yeah, that that's that's the other thing. You know, if you want to know, by the way, how uh, the South is dealing with this and and edging into this kind of thing. Um, 
in my neighborhood, I've noticed it's this very loud festive barbecues for four people. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what I can hear. I can hear cookouts over the fence, right? Like over the fence and like, like distant fence. And it's hilarious because some people have just decided, well, it's spraying. It's warming up. Uh, I'm going to rock. And if it has to just be me and the dog back here, it's just going to be me and the dog. Right. But the music still tuned for 25 people, right. Or 30 people just blasting. And obviously like cooking enough meat on the grill to like to feed 40 and just like, I don't know, man. It's the only way I know how to do it. Just going to rock. Yeah. Look, man, I live in New York. People make decisions all the time about what we going to listen to on the train. <laughs> they make that decision at CVS, right? This is a real inexplicably headphones optional place, right? And not just playing from their phones, playing from speakers that they are wheeling around on a dolly. <laughs> like, I just don't know what happens, like where, where the point is where you decide that I'm the DJ. Everybody going to listen to this. I mean, and it could be anything, man. Anything at all. Yeah. Um, what's the weirdest thing that you've heard? I don't know about weird. Like, I don't want to say gospel music is weird. But when somebody decides that the grocery store is going to be church just because for them, it's like, oh, okay. Like, I guess that's what it's going to be. You just get like, what? let me tell you one thing, man. I don't know how often in Atlanta you ride around and somebody's blasting some DMX, but in Harlem, USA, DMX never went nowhere. <laughs> it's live, like live and current. You know who's hot right now? DMX. Dude, I was walking down the street before it got locked down at night and I walked past this bodega and it was like three or four dudes that I'm guessing in their mid to late forties and they had the speaker on the corner and they were playing the locks. As just as I imagined they did in 1999. Just kept it going. <laughs> just kept it going, man. My pants, impossibly huge. Yes. Yes. There was some of that. You know, my, my hat pulled so low that I actually bump into things. <laughs> it, they, it never stopped for them. You know, y'all, cause it ain't that far. No, I, you know what I did here? This, this shocked me. So, um, I'm at a light the other day, uh, going to get gas and to my left, uh, there is a, um, uh, this is, so this was driving through the West End in Atlanta, all right? And there is a massive muscle car, right? I think it was a Dodge Charger. And it's got the racing stripe, and it's got uh, the super roided up system. It has got the windows just rattling. And I was like, oh, yeah, that, that's, that's a setup, man. You know, deep tint on the windows, like deep tint. And I heard the beat, and I thought, oh, man, that's, I think I know that. Okay. I don't think that's, what is that? And I was like, Oh my God. And the guy rolls down his windows for a second and he is blasting. I can't go for that by Hall and Oates. Oh, I mean, he's, bla he's blasting it like it was Slayer, right? Like he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's blasting it like it was blackened live 1989 Metallica in Seattle, right? And, and just destroying his hearing with it. And I thought that is the smoothest way to go deaf I can possibly imagine. All of this combined. And for those of you who don't get it, I can't explain it to you in enough time to take place. Like the fact that this story starts with you driving by the West End is everything about 2020 Atlanta. Like all of that right there. <laughs> yeah. You know what? You don't know the, the good fish place in the West End coming out of this voice, right? <laughs> you don't know Bankhead Seafood? Come on. Yo, I just saw that T.I. bought Bankhead Seafood, and I'm like, okay, cool. So does that mean this place will now have regular hours? Uh, it, me it might have regular hours. I bet that the menu is going to get a lot more verbose. <laughs> <laughs> no place in the world has ever required calling first, quite like Bankhead Seafood. <laughs> Like, Bankhead Seafood, I want to say it would be open, like, from Wednesday to Sunday every other week, right? Like, you couldn't bet on the week. It wasn't just about the day. Yeah, yeah. It, I, you will be amazed at how many places here you still have to call to make sure that they exist. And I mean basic places. It's not like, oh, this onesie. It's not like, oh, Bankhead Seafood. Not some family-owned place. Like, you might have to call the Kroger. I don't mean just because of, like, <laughs> coronavirus. Kroger just might, you know, like, I don't know. We closed at 7 tonight. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> I'm not uh, like, and I don't know. You get mad. You, like, there's no point getting mad about it. That's on you. You should have called. <laughs> you knew who we were. Oh, yeah. That's, that's the other thing. It's like, it's the Popeyes rule, right? There are certain businesses, uh, anywhere 
right? Where you just have to go, hey, they've clearly told me this is the gig. This is how this works. It's on me to make sure that they're open. It's on me to make sure I get there. And when I get there, I can't expect anything. I just have to see what happens, right? It could be crazy. There was a barbecue joint in, in Warner Robins that was like that I went to. I was like, I, I would like, you know, the brisket and the onion rings. Cool. I got the pork, the fries, and an egg roll. And I'm like, um, okay, that's how this works, right? <laughs> like, I can't tell you. Clearly, you're wrong. No, this is the experience I just signed up for, right? You know what I did? I, I ate it all. It was great. It was fine, except the egg roll. Yeah, that's a little I, – I, I see where you're coming from on that one. Yeah, and that and that's just like like I, I really respect when a business just does that, right? Like when the expectations are set in the first interaction, and from that point on, they will be exactly the same every time. And by that, I mean different. All right, we'll be back in a minute with Spencer Hall. But first, tired of that 230 feeling? You're not alone. In fact, research shows that more than 70% of us hit the wall after lunch. Let a five-hour energy shot help you leap over that wall instead of crashing into it. Anyone who travels frequently knows how tiring it can be. Whether you're on business or on vacation, a five-hour energy shot can help you stay alert and energized wherever you may be headed. Five-hour energy helps you get through your crazy on-the-go life. With zero sugar, four calories, and a convenient portable size, it's the perfect pick-me-up for busy, hard-working people. Now it comes in two great extra strength tropical tastes, strawberry banana and tropical burst. They are delicious and can take you to a tropical on-the-go experience. Try them both, then go online at shop5hourenergy.com and use the code BOMANI to receive a one-time offer of 10% off your order. Shop the number 5 hourenergy.com and use the code BOMANI to receive a one-time offer of 10% off your first order. Go to shop5hourenergy.com and use the code BOMANI to receive a one-time offer of 10% off your order. 5-Hour Energy, energy on the go. Before we go, this has been a delightful hour, by the way. Uh, Before we go, I want to ask you about, like, how do you think Tom Brady's going to enjoy living in Tampa, Florida? Well, uh, Tom Brady has spent like the last three, four, five, six years trying to build up his reputation as a lifestyle guru and trying to sell infrared pajamas and cookbooks and turning himself into kind of a, you know, I think aspirational Northeastern bro who wears shorts in the winter kind of Martha Stewart guy, right? So guess where he's moving to? He's moving to the home of like, the home shopping network now owned by QVC. He's moving to a place where for a long time, when I spent some time there, one of their biggest celebrities was uh television psychic, Gary Spivey. He's going to the place that was the home to, uh I believe Billy Mays. Yeah. He's, he's going to a place where I think he's going to be fine. He's going to be great. He's going to live on an Island next to Derek Jeter. Do you know what he's going, his experience in Tampa is going to be so much different than the Gen Pop experience in Tampa, right? Because he's going to go down there like everyone else from the Northeast I was talking about and just go, yeah, man, life's a beach. It's crazy. It's like Jimmy Buffett every day down here. You think Hulkamania going to show him around? There is absolutely no chance that Hulk is going to have any contact with Tom Brady because Tom Brady's like, hmm, that's brand incompatibility. I'm not going to do that. I don't know. I feel like I feel like it could go both ways. You know who does live in Tampa is Dave Batista, and he has like a evidently Dave Batista bought a medieval castle in the middle of Tampa, and lives there and has like gas lights and stuff on his house. So maybe Dave Batista, because Dave Batista does Hollywood movies, and I think Brady would go. Well, you're still doing Hollywood movies. It's been a minute for the Hulkster on the Hollywood thing, right? Like, I think there was like, uh, he did the nanny movie and that was like 25 years ago or something. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, I don't think like, I think Tom is, Tom's, Tom's a little bit about the image and the maintenance, right? So he would be like, eh, I don't know. He got, he got burned by having like the MAGA hat in the back of his locker. So he's very conscious of who he's pictured with. I think Dave Batista might be acceptable, right? But remember, Tampa's a place you end up. It's not a place that you go. And I would also point this out, by the way. Everybody's missed this whole thing. You know the biggest thing that they've missed in this, right? Like, is he going to be successful in Tampa? Doesn't matter. He's already successful. Nobody goes to the Bucks to be successful. Nobody. That's just not, you know, like historically what you go to the Bucks for is you go to like get a big free agent signing, appear for a couple of years and go somebody else, somewhere else. That's just how it works, right? Uh, and now the Bucks are just this big like debt sink for the Glazer family. So no one's paying attention, right? James Winston threw like 30 picks last year. Think about this. He threw 30 picks, bad ones. And 
How much of a story was that? Not as much as it should have been. <laughs> Nothing's a story in Tampa. That's my rule. Nothing's a story, right? Tom Brady's got like at week nine, Tom Brady's going to get sacked five times and throw three picks. And you know what kind of a story it's going to be? Eh. Eh. Yeah, I wonder about that because he's still Tom Brady, right? Not for long. <laughs> he belongs to Tampa now. He ended up there. He didn't go there. He ended up there. And this happens like, you know, if you hang around long enough, this happens to everybody, right? Joe Montana ended up in Kansas City, right? You know, there have been tons of quarterbacks and skilled players who held on too long. Emmett Smith, uh, it was the Cardinals, right? Emmett Smith ended up in an Arizona Cardinals jersey for a minute. Yes, he did. Nobody remembers that. Like, none of this matters. It does not matter. And he's going to one of the towns where events and news happen less than anywhere else. Think about this. Tampa can't even get top billing in its own state. You don't, we don't call them Tampa men, even though a good 30%, 40% of Florida man stories happen in Florida. No, it's Florida man. They can't even get top billing in their own state. Miami eclipses them. No one actually knows what Tampa is unless you've lived there. And I will tell you this, living there doesn't help answer the question much. It really doesn't. I lived there for two and a half years. And um, when somebody says, what's your favorite restaurant? Given a chain is a perfectly acceptable answer. I went to Tampa to cover the ACC tournament in 2007. And let me tell you something. Tampa, it's just like Compton. What <laughs> what exit pass downtown? And all of a sudden, it's like, who has a lot of bars on these windows? Uh, Tampa in, and St. Petersburg, both among the most segregated cities in America. And I mean on the tracks. Like, on the tracks. It is that clear, Right. Again, another thing that Tom Brady will perhaps not have a whole lot of exposure on because he's just going to live on a, like an island. That's it. He's going to live on an island next to uh, Derek Jeter. Be like, yeah, man, I love this place. No, you don't. You love your house. You don't know that place. He ain't going to make it to the Mons. I don't think he's making it to there, to 2001. I don't think he's making it to the good raceway or the other raceway. I don't think he's going to Boomsday. I don't even know if they do Boomsday anymore. Probably dating myself. That was the big thing when I lived at. They're like, yeah, man, we're going to go to Boomsday. What is it? It's a fireworks display. <laughs> we all drive our Jeeps onto the beach. I don't think Tom Brady's going to be driving his car onto the beach. <laughs> like I, I say this to somebody who writes through a nine, like a, an eight month off season every single year. NFL people wondering like, Oh man, is Tampa going to be successful? Why are you even asking that question? Is this going to matter? What does this say about Brady's legacy? Nothing. No one will remember it. This is just the most hollow, like here, take a check. See who'll show up at that stadium. Tom Brady's going to be playing in like, He's been in New England his whole career. And then he played at Michigan. And he's from California. And I know he's played in humidity and heat before. But you're going to roll 43-year-old Tom Brady out there <laughs> on a sandy field when it's 91 degrees with 60% humidity for at least eight games? Oh, that's going to be great. Phenomenal. By the way, I think lost in this. I think a potentially fascinating subplot of this NFL season is post-LASIK Jasmus. Right? Like... He threw picks that made you wonder if he could see. Now apparently he can. <laughs> oh, now Jameis, now Jameis is just going to go like 48 for 48 every game. Yo, it's hard. Here's the thing. Now, granted, everybody was open in 2013, but the quarterback we saw in 2013 is so dramatically different than the quarterback we've seen ever since, like including that next year. And he did incredible things at points in 2014, but he also threw a bunch of those picks where you're like, yo, you didn't see that dude standing right there. I'm just saying, what if? Because I wouldn't bet on it, but what if? I will laugh real hard because I don't think vision's ever been the thing with Jameis. I think it's always been his brain. You can see there's at least three or four clips from his last season at Florida State where you can see Jimbo Fisher, and I mean verbatim on Jimbo's very readable lips, saying, Jameis, calm the f*** down. <laughs> Jameis, calm down or I'm going to put you on the bench. Like, he turns into... <laughs> Uh, he just turns into like an elementary school teacher because temperamentally, I think once he gets, once he gets wound up, you know, like I think Jameis has a weird combination of a complete lack of memory, right? In terms of the specifics, right? If he throws a pick, he'll go out there the next one and go new down, new down. And he means it, right? But that panic, that kind of like being wound up, trying to make things happen, that doesn't go away. And I think once that, you know, like once that gets uncorked, it's loose. And I think it's always been loose. I think it's one of the things that makes him good because when he's, when he's real hot, when he's on, he is super on. And, and when he's not, that kind of emotion just forces him to like, you know, and the confidence that he has. Cause that's the other thing. Still confident, right? It's not like he's throwing hesitant interceptions. No man, right between, <laughs> right between the numbers, right? Just like winging it. 
So it's this combination of factors that can make him really good at times, but always invites this monster called turnovers into the room. Yeah, he's also got one of these dudes with a big old football brain, but I think he's out here doing all that reading before the snap, and he thinks he's outsmarted the game, and you can show him one thing and do another, and he's like, oh, damn, got me again. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, like, no, it's like, he's always had like the homework thing down too, right? Like that was apparent from, from like first snap, like when he comes out and he, he just carves pit up in his first game as a starter, it was real obvious that his pre-snap reads are great. You know what NFL defensive coordinators like to do to that? They're like, oh, that's cute. You read that. That's awesome. Bloop. How you like the next line? They're like optometrists here. I'm going to flip this up, mess up your vision. How, how can you read that next line? No. Wild. We got an interception. Yeah. So. I, I, I don't know. Like, like that's an amazing story with Jameis. I don't even have like a vague interest in, in Brady with the Bucks other than what the hell Tom Brady's going to do in, in Tampa. You know, like I, I did laugh because one of the things Florida grows best are like strawberries and tomatoes. It's right next door. Plant City has like a strawberry festival. I just had this thing where like Tom Brady's at some sort of like, you know, civic thing, right? Like try some Plant City strawberries. And he's like, I'm sorry. I don't eat those. They're red. Right. They're red. I only eat like greens and weird spirulina shakes. This, uh, yeah, I can't. It like the idea of him trying to engage at a civic level with Tampa in any way is hilarious to me. Well, I'd love the good for him on this. He got them to guarantee thirty per for two years. You cannot give a forty-three year old man a two-year guaranteed contract. <laughs> I mean, you you can. <laughs> right. You know, he's going to make very different. He's going to make very different decisions uh, about what he's going to do with his forty-four and forty-five year old self, isn't he? <laughs> if you give him a two year, that's a very different decision than when you're giving it to a 31 year old. He's like, yeah, man, I still got some stuff to prove. <laughs> What's Tom Brady got to prove? You know what he's got to prove? He's got to prove what everybody who moves to Florida proves that Florida has no state income tax. Just, <laughs> he is moving from Massachusetts to Florida. You know who moves to, from Massachusetts to Florida? All right. Retirees, mobsters, and people trying to dodge income tax. That's. Who's trying to do it? You know what they can't take from you if you declare bankruptcy in the state of Florida? Your house. That's why OJ and Jeff Skilling both bought houses right before they were going to go up the river because uh, you can keep that house. They're not, they're not going to make you sell it any kind of settlement, right? So either Tom Brady is planning some sort of massive criminal conspiracy or he is getting ready to retire with a comfortable tax margin. Oh, I kind of miss Florida. Uh, Spencer Hall, check him out. BannerSociety.com. Best college football writer in America. Post it up at the crib. Forever. We're, we're here forever, y'all. Yeah. Long haul, baby. Long haul. And ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on The Right Time. We do this thing a couple times a week. My man Gabe Bassane handles everything behind the scenes. Thank you, sir. Thank you to Spencer Hall. Also, thanks to our sponsors. Thanks to My Computer Career. Thanks to ZipRecruiter. Thanks to 5-Hour Energy. Uh, remember, subscribe to The Right Time. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. And we'll talk to you guys in a couple of days. Take it easy. Thanks for checking out The Right Time with Bomani Jones Podcast. You can listen or subscribe on the ESPN app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. The Right Time with Bomani Jones.